Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 13. The Lord said, These people approach me with their speeches to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me, and human rules direct their worship of me. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for our ability to gather today in this place. We are grateful for a space to come together and worship you. Lord, please be with those who are unable to be with our church family today. We pray for those that are sick and for those who are traveling. Lord, continue to draw us closer to you so that we can be your hands and feet within our church body. Lord, we pray that each person here will feel the love of their neighbor as we learn to love as you love us. Lord, thank you that even though we are stubborn and a stiff-necked people, just like the Israelites, you took mercy on us and sent your son to die for us. Lord, your patience and holiness is unfathomable to us, and we stand in awe of how you continue to pursue your people, even when they sin against you. Lord, please open our hearts to hear your word and be with Pastor Ryan as he guides us today through a difficult passage. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Teresa. You may be seated. If you have a Bible, please open it up to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 11 is where we're going to be this morning. If you're visiting with us, welcome. We have been steadily walking through this book of Judges as we've seen God's covenant faithfulness to a wayward and rebellious people time and time again. And today will be no different. We have mentioned over the past few weeks this downward spiral concerning the book of Judges, and today it will feel like we hit rock bottom. I have been wrestling with this passage all week, and it has not been easy. In fact, the passage hurts. It is weighty. It's one of the darker scenes in all of Scripture. It's even well known by those who actually don't know the Bible at all. In fact, in talking with a brother here who does know the Bible uh, about this passage, he frankly told me it's his least favorite passage in all of Scripture. And I get that. I do. And we need to feel the weight and the darkness of it this morning so that we see the beauty of God and his gospel all the more. Because God, through his word, has something to teach us from it. I firmly believe that. And so part of the main emphasis from today's passage is on words. That's why I have entitled this morning's message, The Words We Speak. The words spoken here are very important in this passage as they are the instrument of our particular judge this morning for both good and bad, for his rising up and his downfall. We've seen from previous uh, judges certain things, certain tools, certain instruments that have been used. We can think of the tent peg and Jael. We can think of Ehud and the hidden dagger, even Gideon and the fleece. Next week, we will see uh, Samson and his hair, but today, it is Jephthah and his words. And I don't have to tell you that the words we speak matter. Our God is a God who reveals himself through speech, through words, and he has graciously given to his people his revealed word in the Bible. This is how we come to learn of him, to know him, to proclaim him, and so our words matter. And here, we will see the truth of that in this text as well. This morning, we have five points as we walk through our passage, five words, if you will. Application will be given throughout and then a little bit at the end. And I said that this passage is all about words, so the points highlight this. If you're taking notes, there's an outline provided in the bulletin. Let me give you the five points up front so you can follow along. First, we'll see meaningless words, followed by desperate words. Third is foolish words. Fourth is deathly words. And five is no words. First is meaningless words. To see the meaningless words and to set the context of Jephthah, we just back up into chapter 10. And Daniel taught us last week on the ruthless and anti-Christ king Abimelech. And after his death, Israel has a few quick judges until we read in chapter 10, starting in verse 6. Then the Israelites, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They worshiped the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Aram, Sidon, and Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites and the Philistines. They abandoned the Lord and did not worship him. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he sold them to the Philistines and the Ammonites. They shattered and crushed the Israelites that year. And for 18 years, they did the same to all the Israelites who were on the other side of the Jordan, the land of the Amorites and Gilead. 
The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. Israel was greatly oppressed, so they cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you. We have abandoned our gods and worshipped the Baals. At this point in Judges, we are used to the pattern. God's people sin and rebel. They are judged. God brings about a deliverer. But here in chapter 10, we have a wrinkle in the pattern. God's people sin as we read, but the response from God, as we will come to see, is not what you would expect. So backing up, verse 6 is the key. Notice how the writer of Judges includes all of their idolatry. He says they worship the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Aram, Sidon, and Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites and the Philistines. They abandoned the Lord and did not worship him. They were worshiping everybody else but Yahweh. And as time has gone on, Israel, rather than being a strong light to the nations, being a lighthouse to a dark sea of sin, Israel is now a broken, flickering light that at times gives little moments to shine, but for the most part only provides darkness. We've been repeating it these last few weeks, but Israel has truly become Canaanized. Israel has allowed the surrounding nations to infiltrate them. And notice here that their idolatry isn't just with Baal anymore. It's with all the gods. And we hear gods, hear demonic spirits of the surrounding nations. So as time has gone on, Israel has been given over to judgment. So God gives them over to judgment from the surrounding nations for 18 long and weary years until they come once more to their senses and they cry out to God for forgiveness and deliverance. And we see it in verse 10. They say, we have sinned against you. We have abandoned our God. Notice the our God there and worship the Baals. They know that Yahweh is their covenant God. He is the God of Israel. They are his people. Our God, they say. And at this point... You would expect to read once more, as we've seen already, God relented. God forgave them. God raised up a judge. But notice God's response. It's a little sarcastic, at least that's how I read it. It's a little cheeky, as the Brits would say. He's fed up, and he's letting them know it. Judges chapter 10, verses 11 to 14. The Lord said to the Israelites, When the Egyptians, Amorites, Ammonites, Philistines, Sidonians, Amalekites, and Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, Did I not deliver you from them? But you have abandoned me and worshipped other gods. Therefore, I will not deliver you again. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them deliver you whenever you are oppressed. Let those fake gods deliver you. Cry out to your other gods, he said. You've been whoring after them. Let them deliver you. Yahweh is fed up. This isn't the God we're supposed to be seeing in the Bible. This is not the God we often hear about in Scripture. He's always supposed to forgive. But keep in mind the pattern here. How many times has Yahweh done, or excuse me, has Israel done this very thing? They are abusing the grace and mercy of God. They're coming back to Him time and time again, promising to not give their love and devotion to another, only to do it again. These are meaningless words. And what we need to see here is that like Israel, sometimes we as well can take God for granted. We can take his grace for granted and end up abusing it. We can keep thinking that God is this safe God. He's this gentle, elderly, grandpa-type figure who always tells us it'll be okay, and he gives us a lollipop when we mess up. But that is not the God of the Bible. That is not the Holy One of Israel. His holiness burns against sin. He is safe insofar as you are found in his son, Jesus Christ. But being found outside of him, he's not safe at all. Christ has come inviting you and I to be reconciled to the Father, to be a part of his kingdom, to be his disciples here on earth. That's in part the good news of the gospel, that God is reconciling sinners to himself So that all who place their faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins can be forgiven and can be with him for eternal life. You can do nothing, scripture tells us, to earn this salvation. It is, as Ephesians says, the free gift of God. And so Christ comes declaring the kingdom and calling on all to repent and believe. But when he comes again, it will not be like that first coming. He will come in judgment judging the living and the dead, and all the earth will know what the fear of the Lord actually looks like on that day. And so Israel here gets a stern rebuke from God. No, you go to your other gods. You go to the ones that you've been seeking after. 
Israel thought that they could just keep coming back and back and never pay the consequences. And so again, we're confronted. Are we in a way like Israel here? Are we in a habitual pattern of sin where we keep coming back to God, promising to not do it again? And each time we come back to the Lord, swearing that that was the last time, never again. My friend, as we will sing in a bit, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. We're going to see that in this text as well. But the fight for holiness has to be taken seriously. We communicate to you guys often that we need to be seeking accountability, opening up to someone, fighting like our lives depend on it as we pursue holiness and we look to the cross, we look to the Savior who died for us, and we trust that because of what He did, we can then, by the power of His Holy Spirit, uh, defeat that sin that so easily entangles us. We will struggle with sin until we die or until we go or until the Lord comes back. But in light of that, Let us not be a people who don't fight, who don't fight for holiness. So feel this tension here. Yahweh is so fed up with them. He knows how they are. He knows that they're going to abuse his grace. But then look at this last section. Judges chapter 10, verses 15 and 16. But the Israelites said, we have sinned. Deal with us as you see fit. Only rescue us today. So they got rid of the foreign gods among them and they worshiped the Lord and he became weary of Israel's misery. Yahweh our God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, becomes weary of Israel's misery. Literally, it means in Hebrew that his soul was short. In other words, most see this again as just meaningless words. He knows that their heart is not in it. It is worship on the outside while their heart is far from God. This is a conversion of convenience. Save me from my enemies. They need God to save them. And so they will say and do the right things, but as we know, they will end up right back where they were. Sure, we will worship him now, then he will save us. So God is weary, yet in some way, in his grace, he's still going to bless their futile efforts to get a deliverer. Point number two, desperate words. Desperate words. Starting in chapter 11, verse 1, Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute, and Gilead was his father. Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when they grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You will have no inheritance in our father's family because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Then some worthless men joined Jephthah and went on raids with him. Sometime later, the Ammonites fought against Israel. When the Ammonites made war with Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. They said to him, Come, be our commander, and let's fight the Ammonites. Jephthah replied to the elders of Gilead, didn't you hate me and drive me out of my father's family? Why then have you come to me now when you're in trouble? They answered Jephthah, that's true, but now we come to you. Come with us, fight the Ammonites, and you will become leader of all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to them, if you are bringing me back to fight the Ammonites and the Lord gives them to me, I will be your leader. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord is our witness if we don't do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead. The people made him their leader and commander, and Jephthah repeated all his terms in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah. Few things to note and understand. If you look at the very end of chapter 10, the Ammonites were called together, and they are encamped against Israel. They're encamped across from them. War is impending. And so the men of Gilead basically put out a help wanted sign, wanting a military commander, and the reward is that you get to be president of the people. And no one in town wants it. (laughs) Tells us something about politics. They are too afraid. The Ammonites are showing that they're about to attack and everyone is scared. And then we are introduced in chapter 11, verse 1 to Jephthah. Jephthah is a valiant warrior, but he comes from the wrong side of the tracks. His father had an adulterous relationship with a prostitute and he is the offspring. Eventually, the son of Gilead's wife, his half-brothers, the sons, excuse me, run him off after they realize that they don't want to share any inheritance with him. They want more for themselves. So he flees to the land of Tob, and some worthless men join him, and they start raiding other towns. They are marauders, preying on the weak and the unprotected. And after some time, when Gilead needs a leader, because the Ammonites are attacking, no one in town steps up, so they get desperate. They go to Jephthah. 
the bastard bandit. And in their desperation, they can barter with him no more. Or excuse me, they can barter with him. Come, lead us. Be our commander. Be our war leader, in essence, our war chief. That's how they start the argument. I think that they're still hoping to not make him ruler or president, but he shoots back at them. Didn't you hate me and drive me off? Why are you coming to me? Lead us, they respond. And in this second response, they say, be our leader, be our ruler, be our head. The difference here between commander and leader is evident. One just leads the army. The other leads all the people. At first, they just want to make him commander. But Jephthah is wise with his words. And Gilead is desperate. He will be their ruler. As I said, that word implies the literal head. They are promising in a way, they're promising him in a way, kingship. And notice here the difference compared to the other previous judges. God is not present here. He will bless their choice as we're going to come to see. But unlike Othniel or Ehud or Deborah and Barak and even Samson, we don't read the words, and the Lord raised up Jephthah. But instead, in verse 10, the people made him their leader and commander, commander, and Jephthah repeated the appropriate terms in the presence of the Lord. And then there's this large section starting in verse 12 and going all the way to verse 28. I'm just going to briefly summarize it. Jephthah deals wisely in trying to negotiate with the king of the Ammonites. He just tells the truth, and he does it historically and theologically. The Ammonites were driven from the land historically. Israel possessed the land, and this land didn't belong to Moab or Ammon. How could it be yours, he's telling them? It's not your land. Quit making up and changing history. And then theologically, Yahweh did this. Our God, as opposed to your gods, drove you out, all right, and then we got to inhabit the land. Those are the verses summarized. And Jephthah does a great job with his words. But it's the desperation of the Gideonites I want us to focus on just briefly as we think through application. Let me ask you this. When times are desperate in your life, and we've all been there, who or what do you turn to? In your desperation, in your stress, in your heightened anxiety that maybe you're feeling even in this season right now, who or what are you turning to? The Gideonites have an army encamped at their door, and they are desperate for someone to lead them. They don't consult God. They don't turn to God. They don't pray to God. They take matters into their own hands. So what about you? Do you medicate with something as your solution? Calm the nerves a bit? Do you turn to alcohol? Do you internalize everything and then blow up at some point, lashing out at your spouse or your kids? Or do you de-stress by looking secretly at something that you shouldn't? When times are desperate, who or what do you turn to? Anything or anyone other than God is a failed solution. It might provide a temporary reprieve, but it will leave you longing for the deeper love and satisfaction that only he can provide. This scene of desperate words here causes us to think of how we are in our desperation. Do we turn to God first or do we seek to take matters into our own hands? I know my disposition. I know that over the years, I try to fix it myself to solve the dilemma or my stress or my worry myself and my flesh. I want me to be the answer. It is to my shame that I don't often turn to God in prayer before considering how I can best do it myself. CCC, may we be a people who are quick to both turn to God first and encourage others to do the same. Point number three, foolish words. We come now to what is the heart of the story, what is famous about this story, and what everyone typically wants to get to. I made you wait a bit, I'm sorry. I think even the way the writer frames this story is heightening the the suspense and leading us to this very act, some of the most foolish and stupidest words ever spoken. Chapter 11, verse 29. The Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah, who traveled through Gilead and Manasseh, and then through Mizpah of Gilead. He crossed over the Ammonites from Mizpah of Gilead. Jephthah made this vow to the Lord. If you, in fact, hand over the Ammonites to me, whoever comes out of the doors of my house to greet me when I return safely from the Ammonites will belong to the Lord, and I will offer that person as a burnt offering. Words were the greatest skill of Jephthah. Words got him what he wanted with the Gideonites. Words were his first line of defense at seeking to sway the Ammonites. And now words are what Jephthah uses to seek to have God do his bidding. If you hand over the Ammonites to me, 
Whoever comes out of the doors of my house to greet me, when I return, I will offer as a burnt offering. In the Hebrew, it's more of whatever comes out of my house, but the CSB is right here. Elsewhere, that language is never used of an animal coming to greet someone as they return from battle, only of people. So it is these words, prideful words, foolish words, we can say stupid words, that we see Jephthah's fate being sealed. For in his mind, he's going to make this vow to the Lord in order to guarantee the outcome, to guarantee his future. In a way, he wants God to do his bidding for him, so he's sweetening the deal. God, give me victory, and I will give you sacrifice. And so in our sin, God gives us over exactly to the very thing we want. And Jephthah's going to experience that firsthand. We do this all the time with God, don't we? We subtly want to manipulate God. Oh, God! If you do this for me, then I will do this for you. If you give me a spouse, give me a child, give me that promotion, whatever else, then I will truly live for you. Then I will know that you care. Then I will, then I will, then I will. We barter with God all the time, not realizing that that is a pagan way to live and to pray. Remember what we've been saying all along? Israel has become Canaanized. They are letting the surrounding nations influence them and shape them, and they're worshiping these false gods, and God has given them over to it, and this is exactly what we see with Jephthah. You see, in this day and age, in some ways today, pagan nations were always trying to appease their gods, always trying to perform vows, to perform sacrifices, even of children, to perform acts of worship so that the gods would be pleased with them and love them and care for them and provide for them. But that is not our God. Our God is not after rote acts of worship or mundane performances of religiosity just so that he might listen to us. He loves us so much more than that. He cares for us immensely, and rather than us trying to earn something, trying to barter for something, trying to sway him in some way, rather than all of that, he gives us everything in the sacrifice of his son. You don't have to barter with God. It's a free gift that has been given, not to be negotiated for. And so when you're tempted to do that, even in your prayer life, tempted to offer more of yourself or your works or what you can do so that he might do something for you, Remember this story, and remember the tragedy that's coming. I think what's so striking about this foolishness and these foolish words is how unneeded it was. This vow never had to be said. The spirit of the Lord, we read, comes upon him, and the next few verses aren't even needed. We would have been reading about the victory right away. That's what happened with the previous judges, but this is Jephthah's own doing. It's his own foolishness. And so the narrator records the victory. It's a resounding victory over the Ammonites. All the while, we're wondering what is going to become of that vow. Verse 34. When Jephthah went to his home in Mizpah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. She was his only child. He had no other son or daughter beside her. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and he said, No, not my daughter. You have devastated me. You have brought great misery on me. I have given my word to the Lord and cannot take it back. Then she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said. For the Lord brought vengeance on your enemies, the Ammonites. She also said to her father, Let me do this one thing. Let me wander two months through the mountains with my friends and mourn my virginity. Go, he said, and he sent her away two months. So she left with her friends and mourned her virginity as she wandered through the mountains. A man of faith, Jephthah was, a man whom God empowered by his Holy Spirit to deliver these people, and a man who sins so foolishly. We reach the breaking point of the text, as the one who comes out to meet Jephthah is his only daughter, his one and only daughter. She's coming to greet her daddy and to celebrate with him. I am blessed by God to have four little kids, one boy and three girls. And in this sweet season of life, I am their hero. My wife would reluctantly admit that I'm the favorite right now, and so I'm trying to soak it up with everything it's worth. <laughs> so when I walk in from work or from being gone, it's, Daddy, Dad's here. Dad, play with me first. Jeff is always reminding the associate pastors to enjoy these years, and so I'm trying to do just that. Outside of Christ and my wife, they are my greatest joy, 
my greatest delight. I love that greeting when I get home from work. I love it. So Jephthah's daughter wants to give her daddy a hero's welcome. He has delivered the Gileadites. Her daddy is the hero of the nation. So she comes out to greet her father with joyful tambourines and dancing, wanting to celebrate with him. This scene reminds us of the other faithful women of God. Like when Miriam leads a celebration after passing through the Red Sea in Exodus 15. Or when the women of Israel were singing and dancing after David's defeat of the Philistines in 1 Samuel 18. And so Jephthah's daughter wants to give her daddy a hero's welcome. We feel her joy. You know, we feel the grief and sorrow that's coming as well. This joy is about to turn to tragedy. Two things to note from this scene. First, subpoints Jephthah's pride. His pride is undergirding so much of this. Jephthah wanted to be, had to be, ruler of the Gideonites, so much so that he would make this foolish vow. And then look here in the text. Even in his agony, it's undergirded with pride. No, not my daughter. You have devastated me. You have brought great misery on me. I have given my word to the Lord and cannot take it back. He blames his daughter. He doesn't say, what have I done? How could I be so stupid? You, my daughter, you did this to me. Such sorry words to say to your child. His ambition, his pride, the hope he had of leading and securing a future for his family as his only daughter will be killed and thus any future offspring as well. In this scene, Jephthah is a sorry excuse for a man and a father. On today of all days, what can we learn from this? Well, first, let me say Happy Father's Day. <laughs> this text falling on today, I am always amazed at the providence of God. We planned this out a long time ago. Fatherhood is a blessing and a privilege and a high calling. We need good fathers. And I'll be honest, in wrestling with this text all week, I've thought about fatherhood a lot. My youngest daughter's birthday was this past Wednesday, and I've had this backdrop of this text in my mind all week just thinking, how? How could he do it? So fathers, let me just offer a brief word of encouragement and a brief word of warning. For encouragement, you are needed. You are vital to the life of your kids. You set the tone in so many ways of the home. Even in the teenage years, when you feel like your kids might not be all that interested, trust me, they are and they need you. Yes, they're mean, but they need you. <laughs> they need your attention. They need your diligence in pursuing them, even after you're turned away time and time again. They need that diligence. And I could give you statistic after statistic about how fatherlessness and fatherless homes are the single greatest criteria of crime, abuse, drug, drug use, etc. So my encouragement to you today, of all days, is that your day-to-day -day faithfulness of following after God while seeking to love and lead your home well is infinitely important. Nothing is more important. The sacrifices that you make to be with your family are always worth it. Your family needs you. And I'm reminding myself of this just as much as you. But also a warning. Jephthah was willing to sacrifice anything for the outcome he wanted. He needed the recognition. He needed the position. He needed the authority. So what are you willing to sacrifice? for your ambition? What are you willing to sacrifice for that dream job, for money, for recognition? May it never be our families. May it never be our children. Let us not be so busy with work or with hobbies or with clubs or sports that we are barely home where it matters. Are your wife and your kids getting the leftovers of your time and energy? Sure. You aren't physically laying them down on the altar like Jephthah will, but the sacrifice is just the same. Emotionally and physically, are you present? Jephthah is not the first, nor is he the last father to sacrifice his child for a career. Let us feel the weight of that today. Second thing, though, I want us to see is his daughter's courage. His daughter's courage. She is beautiful in every sense of the word. This young woman is beautiful. I wish we were given more about her because despite Jephthah's failings here, his daughter is showing her beauty and grace and love for her dad in an astounding way. 
She's most likely in her teenage years, yet her maturity is shining forth in this text. My father, she says, it's okay. Do to me what you vowed because the Lord has given you victory. She's trying to save her dad's integrity for him, trying to save his standing in the eyes of others, trying to honor him by honoring his vow. And it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this because our culture is not an honor-shame culture, but she is showing more honor to her dad than he deserves in the moment. And she is beautiful in doing so. Her memory, as the writer tells us, is celebrated by the young women for generations to come, but she was the victim of faithfulness to an unfaithful vow. In her, as one writer says, we see all the courageous daughters of abusive fathers. Her father failed her, yet she shows her love for him in a way he doesn't deserve. Rather than laying down his life for his daughter, he takes hers. This is fatherhood, manhood, pride, all at their worst, all corrupted by sin in the flesh. This is not how at all God intended or wants things to be, yet it is a stark picture overall of where Israel finds themselves in this season. Fourth, deathly words. Two scenes of death that I want us to briefly think on. Notice the first brief sentence, five words in Hebrew conveying what Jephthah did to his daughter. Judges 11, 39a. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, and here it is, and he kept the vow he had made about her. Hoping to secure a future for himself and his family, he loses it all. He will have no progeny, no offspring. Some understand this to imply that Jephthah didn't actually sacrifice her, but she was devoted in service to the Lord. She was a virgin for the rest of her life and never got to marry. Maybe, but I think it's highly unlikely. The plain reading of the text, Jephthah's vow to burn the sacrifice, and the fact that service to the Lord did not require not being married all lend weight to the other side of the argument in my understanding. Jephthah sacrificed his daughter. And so the question comes, did Jephthah have to? Did he have to sacrifice his daughter? No. He didn't. The Bible is clear that God is against child sacrifice. Deuteronomy 18.10, for instance, no one among you is to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire, practice divination, tell fortunes, interpret omens, practice sorcery. All of those things were common in pagan nations. He could have easily sacrificed his own integrity, easily sacrificed his own pride, easily sacrificed his rulership of the Gideonites. Even as a father, I would venture to say he could have stepped in and taken her place himself. But he doesn't. He kills his own daughter. And the writer of Judges is trying to draw our eyes in the depth of depravity here to the foolishness of sin. And also, once more, to how the nations were inhabiting Israel. This is syncretism. Syncretism is just the blending of religious ideas and thoughts and practices. It's what happens today when we try to import worldly idolatries and unbiblical thought and practices into the church. And here at this time in Israel, syncretism is rampant. So much so that as other nations were, as other nations were sacrificing their children, so the leader of Israel does the same. It's tragic in every sense of the word. But the second scene we must look at briefly it's from the end of Jephthah's reign as a judge. It takes us into the beginning of chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 1. The men of Ephraim were called together and crossed the Jordan to Zaphon. They said to Jephthah, Why have you crossed over to fight against the Ammonites, but you didn't call us to go with you? We will burn your house with you in it. Then Jephthah said to them, My people and I had bitter conflict with the Ammonites, so I called for you, but you didn't deliver me from their power. When I saw that you weren't going to deliver me, I took my life into my own hands and crossed over to the Ammonites, and the Lord handed them over to me. Why then have you come today to fight against me? If you remember at the end of Gideon's life, I preached a few weeks back, he has a run-in with Ephraim, and here we have them again, the prima donnas of Israel. They feel left out, even though they were invited, but they don't get the credit, they don't get the glory, and that's an issue with them. And notice how it ends, verse 4. Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead. They fought and defeated Ephraim, again, just infighting within Israel, because Ephraim had said, you Gileadites are Ephraimite fugitives in the territories of Ephraim and Manasseh. The Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan leading to Ephraim. Whenever a fugitive from Ephraim said, let me cross over, the Gileadites asked him, are you Ephraimite? 
If he answered no, they told him, please say Shibboleth. If he said Sibboleth, because he could not pronounce it correctly, they seized him and executed him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 from Ephraim died in both the battle and the crossings. Jephthah judged Israel six years, and when he died, he was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Once more, the emphasis is on words here, more precisely how they are spoken. And this famous statement of Shibboleth versus Sibboleth has come to imply a belonging to the group, a way in of cultural acceptance. It's like being from the south and saying crick instead of creek. Or I say what you color with are called crowns, but everybody else says crayons. But here in this text, it is simply a password, a password to cross the river, and if they don't say it right, they're dead. Deathly words are at play as the judgment against Ephraim for their pride and folly is executed. Things are so deteriorated, deteriorated in Israel that 42,000 men die. Deathly words in regards to Jephthah's daughter and deathly words that the Ephraimites couldn't say. We have seen meaningless words. We've seen desperate words. We've seen foolish and deathly words. And now we think upon no words. Last point, no words. After the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Jephthah in chapter 11, verse 29, we have no other specific words or actions of the Lord. Sure, the Lord's name is invoked, but there is silence from God. No words from him are spoken. Think back to the end of chapter 10 when we looked at meaningless words and the Israelites' empty repentance. Yahweh, it says, was weary. He was fed up. And while he graciously blesses their efforts of having Jephthah lead them, he is silent For so much of this, Jephthah and the Gideonites in many ways take matters into their own hands, and God lets them. Why does God not speak? Why does he not cry out, Jephthah, stop, like he did with Abraham sacrificing Isaac? Why does God not save the daughter? Why does he stay his hand? Surely words of judgment from God would be better than just his silence. Yet God has given these people to their own devices, and to their own sin. Child sacrifice was a feature of Moabite and Ammonite religions, and now that idolatry is being practiced by God's chosen people. When you replace God with a false god, you end up with demonic practices that degrade the image of God. This is rampant in our culture today. Yet even in that comparison to Abraham, there's a big difference. Abraham was asked by God to do it. It was a test. And here it is just Jephthah who does all this on his own by just opening his mouth and speaking these foolish words. And God is silent. Every believer at some point in their lives will struggle with the silence of God. We struggle with not feeling like our prayers are heard. Struggle with wondering if God even cares. Those are normal, I think, in long walks with God, and in many ways they grow us in our faith. But in those moments, it's vital that we remind ourselves of the promises of God, that we look to the cross where God sent his son to die for us. God is ultimately not silent, but at times it will feel as if he is. Think of the book of Job. 90% or so of that book is Job and his companions either pleading with God or justifying decisions and actions to one another, thinking they know what is right and even how they speak of God. All the while, God remains silent until at the very end he doesn't. He pressures Job with question after question until Job has nothing left to say but to worship God. And this is Job's final response to God, Job 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this who counsels my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. Verse 5, I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I reject my words and I am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. In many ways, I'll be honest, not all of my questions about this text have been answered, but I found comfort in Job's words. So although God might not have any recorded words here in this text, this is not an isolated text. All of the Bible is just not Judges 11, thank the Lord. He has spoken to us so much. 
His words from all of the rest of the book of Judges ring out to his people to repent and not follow after these false gods. His words ring out from other books in the Old Testament that tell us that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that he will not give his glory to another. And that one day, he says, he promises one day that he's going to give his people new hearts that can know and fear him. His words ring out from the New Testament and his son, Jesus Christ, who says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. His words ring out from the cross when he says, it is finished. Lastly, his words ring out from the end of time when he tells us in Revelation 21, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. God is not silent. He has spoken to us. We might not have all the answers yet, but one day everything will be made clear. And in the midst of feeling as if God is silent, we must press into what we know to be true all the more. And so how should we apply this? There's been application throughout, but just two quick things here at the end. First is this, our words matter. Our words matter. First, the story of Jephthah in part teaches that our words matter. And our words to God definitely matter. Let us not barter with God. Let us not pray like a pagan and seek to strike a deal with God. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 6? He says, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles. That word really just means pagan. Since they imagine that they'll be heard for their many words, don't be like them. Because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Jesus also tells us that we'll be judged for every careless word that we speak. It's the same when we sing songs of worship. Are you mouthing the words? Are you singing them half-heartedly? Are you approaching God with reverence and joy that you get to worship the God of the universe? Or are our prayers pagan-like? May it never be so. Our words matter, especially to God, and the way we worship and pray matters as well. Let us remember that. Second, learn from Jephthah's faith. I struggle to even write that statement. I don't like what Jephthah did. In fact, I hate it. And it's hard to separate here the man from his actions, yet that is what the writers of Scripture do. And while I only want to focus on his failings, they focused on his faith. It is often human nature, is it not, that we tend to focus on the one big mess up of someone's life and we characterize them by it. We are slow to see any good apart from their failing. In this time of living in a fallen world, faith is not always as clean cut as we would like it to be. It's not always rainbows and butterflies and smiling, happy faces. People are messed up. And our God is in the business of saving messed up people like you and I. And so it's shocking to me when I read from Hebrews 11 in the great hall of faith that Jephthah was a man of faith. A man of faith, it will say, whom the world was not worthy. And so I struggle with that. What in the world, God? Don't you mean his daughter? No, because Jephthah, like all of us, had immense failings, but he also had faith. I've been talking about how Jephthah knew the importance of words. They were his first point of combat, yet interspersed throughout this text is that Jephthah clearly knew much of God and his ways, even though he didn't follow it. Although somewhat Canaanized, he clearly had an understanding of the workings of God. All of his words about God weren't completely empty. Chapter 11, verse 27, let the Lord who is judged decide today. He knew that the Lord was ultimately the judge of Israel. And so he was a man of faith. But particularly, I want to say this, his faith is shown in keeping his vow. As horrendous as it is, he kept it. So hear me clearly here, hear me clearly. What he did And sacrificing his daughter is something that all of Scripture condemns. But why he did it is something that all of Scripture commends. Frankly, he followed through with his words to God. Is that true of us? Again, the act was horrible, but the why is what we are to learn from. Jephthah knew that words matter. And he demonstrates this with his follow through. Does the Bible offer us a worse role model for godly behavior than Jephthah? 
I can't think of one. Yet according to Hebrews, the world was not worthy of him. This should encourage us all concerning whom God will call his own. If God can call Jephthah, then he can definitely call you and I. The old excuse of God would never save me in light of what I've done kind of pales in comparison to this. And yet he enshrined Jephthah as a hero of the faith. This should give us assurance that when we turn to him in faith, we believe in his son, he accepts us just as well. There are no sins that the blood of Christ can't wash clean. That is the magnitude of the sacrifice of God's, God's son. Despite our sin, despite our failings, his mercy is more to us. Praise God, we serve a God who's in the business of saving sinners. Let's pray. Father, we as your people and as your church are gathered here this morning to hear from you and to sit under your word. Father, I recognize that even on this day, Father's Day, as we seek to look to our Heavenly Father who is perfect and never fails us, we see the exact opposite here in this text. Father, it is hard to think through what he did, yet it's recorded for us and we are to learn from it, for all of Scripture is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So help us to understand that and to see that in light of this text. Would you apply it to our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit? It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.